it's great. It's great to be here. Thank you very much. Um, people have been re in interesting that in this building every clock gives the wrong time. Hmm? Interesting for a speech about the next thing. Um, I, unfortunately, I, I am somebody who um, learned public speaking at the school of um, Fidel Castro and Hugo Chavez. Uh, I brought my own clock. I have been abundantly warned not to speak too long, but um, it's, it's really at your own risk. I'm gonna, I have a text, and I, by God, I'm going to read it. Make no mistake, the planet is going to hell in a handbasket. I think I hardly need to read the riot act to this audience, but it can't be too much asserted that the exponential increase in population growth, the accelerating depletion of resources, global habits of pollution and waste, and the insane inequities of the multinational economy are ravaging our environment. We are in a crisis, and the need for action at every level is imperative. I want to talk to you today about the role of cities and their inhabitants in this, both because they are sources of our shared dilemma and because they are at the heart of the solution. How, how is the simultaneous translation into Dutch going? Yeah. Um, half the population of the planet, something north of three and a half billion souls, now lives in cities. And the increase is exponential and the condition general. Earlier this year, China's urban population passed the number of its rural inhabitants um, uh, as it accelerates towards the norms of the developed world. The U.S. number is 82 percent. Cities consume something like 75 percent of the planet's energy and produce around 80 percent of its greenhouse emissions. And cities schematize the social dimensions of the crisis. Half of the world population lives in slums. In New York, the richest census tract in the United States and the poorest are not more than one mile apart, and the economic distance continues to expand. Such polarization is endemic, and the yawning inequalities evoked by the Occupy movement or the Gini coefficient are vast and growing vaster in too many places. This is a fundamentally political problem, but the crisis of our relationship to the environment is embedded in it. Environmental justice is inseparable from the chemistry and biology of planetary sustainability. And it's important to remember that this is a battle that is very far from won, that attacks on the most fundamental scientific evidence speak to a growing strain of irrationality that's deeply embedded in particular in American politics. Global warming is a hoax. Evolution is a secular humanist shuck. Conservation is a plot against the freedom of capital. Women's reproductive systems automatically shut down in cases of legitimate rape. Earlier this year, in one of the endlessly mindless debates of the Republican Party during the primary season, Rick Santorum, uh, one of our leading tributes of evil stupidity and already at work on another try for the presidency in 2016, railed against environmentalists for opposing our putatively God-given dominion over the earth, bashing those who cleave to the ethics of biodiversity and oppose the plans of the frackers and other avatars of the carbon economy to secure by any means necessary, or as Romney would say, drill baby drill, the oil and gas he insisted was our birthright. With sub-adolescent sarcasm, he dispatched those who displayed tender feelings for other species as soft, sentimental socialists standing athwart a biblically ordained destiny to rule. I shouted at the television that Earth is more than our backyard. It is our home, and that means that we should think twice about taking a shit in the living room that we share. 
I offer this somewhat agitated opening uh, to suggest that it is impossible to think about the technical and physical aspects of our survival, however important they may be, without a deep consideration of the social circumstances that enable them. Both economy and ecology are systems of distribution, and although resilient, they are predicated on limits. Whether the discussion is of peak oil, scarce water, vanishing arable land, the exhaustion of mineral resources, or the levels of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, we're confronted with the urgent need to think about the way in which we produce, conserve, and distribute assets that are not fungible, but finite. The inescapable conclusion is both that access to resources must be radically reconfigured for the sake of equity and that the hyper-profligacy of those of us at the top must be curbed. This means that the old model of development that, sim that seeks simply to bring the globe in line with Western styles of consumption, uh, I would like to buy the world a Coke, must be rapidly abandoned. It is time for a dramatic reversal of knowledge transfer, time for us to stop foisting the paradigm of mindless gluttony on the world and to begin to learn the habits of modesty. Note to China, a car for every comrade dooms us all. This is not a patronizing bit of eco-colonial advice, it's begging for help. It's surely useful to quantify our roles in this, and for a long time, most of us have been using the extremely succinct conceit of the ecological footprint as a way of graphically coming to terms with the rates at which we consume resources. As you know, the ecological footprint is a formula conceived by a couple of Canadian academics, Matthias Wackernagel and William Rees, to illustrate the impact of our bearing capacity on the planet. By using a variety of algorithms, and you can find a zillion variations on the web, it's possible to convert all of our quotidian inputs and outputs into a single value, area. At the individual scale, for example, the footprint of the average American is, so is some something just south of 120 acres. The average Indian uh, is slightly north of two acres. Here is inequality reified. Likewise, American per capita production of greenhouse gases is more than 20 tons a year, while Indians generate fewer than four. At the macro level, the results are even scarier. A standard calculation suggests that we are already using an earth and a half a year to sustain ourselves, and that the level will rise to two earths per annum by 2030. If everyone on the planet consumed at the rate of Americans or Brits or Dutch, we'd need four and a half planets right now. Alternatively, if we all adopted Bangladeshi, Afghani, or Haitian lifestyles, we could make do with only slightly more than one-third of a planet. Contemporary Guatemalan and Ghanaian habits almost perfectly conform with the bearing capacity of a single Earth. Almost any way you slice it, though, this is an accelerating formula for doom, unsustainable unless, you get, uh, unless we can get settled on Mars in a hell of a hurry. Perhaps the rover Curiosity will discover Club Med just over the next Martian rise. Footprinting is not simply a particularly clarifying form of the riot act. It obliges us to think about both our individual behavior and about cities in a different way, offering a new model of extent to add to political boundaries, morphological characteristics, standard metropolitan statistical areas, and other familiar conceptualizations of urban form and dimension. By considering the footprint of a city, the actual area of the planet required for its respiration, we discover that the true size of Los Angeles is the equivalent of Italy, that of its region of Peru, uh, and New York City's area, that of France, and its region, that of Sudan. If nothing else, 
This should resituate the decisions we make as urbanists and designers, make us conscious of the need to think about uh, urban effects in the broadest sense and about the way in which uh, cities enable their citizens to live good lives, both as private individuals and as planetary citizens. But into what kind of design action might such prescriptions translate? Certainly one effective response has been the movement of the past few decades, uh, a movement that descends via the lineage of w William Morris, Ebenezer Howard, Patrick Geddes, Lewis Mumford, and others for compact cities and urban growth boundaries, as well as for thinking about cities regionally and beyond. These strategies have strong appeal and have greatly influenced my own work. Much as I adore the metropole and feel ennobled by my ability to accumulate frequent flyer miles, I am also an advocate for very careful attention to limits. But a simple fixation on scale or boundaries is not enough. To be sure, up to a point, scale translates into efficiency. And clearly, dense cities are far more sustainable than their sprawling suburbs. Much interesting speculation has arisen from this question, including a variety of scintillating urbanistic takeoffs on the work of the biologist Max Kleiber, who famously quantified the greater metabolic efficiency of big creatures. An elephant, while 10,000 times of the size of a, a guinea pig, uses only 1,000 times as much energy. This seems to be true of towns as well. Unfortunately, discussion about cities has for the past decade or so been far too Manichaean and continues to be dominated by an increasingly fruitless schism between positions represented by the figure of Jane Jacobs on one side uh, and Robert Moses, Le Corbusier, and to a slightly more obscure but nevertheless important degree, uh, Ebenezer Howard and Lewis Mumford on the other. Although it pains me to do so as one who reveres the thoughts, actions, and passions of Jane Jacobs, and who has spent most of his adult life in her old Greenwich Village stomping ground, it's nevertheless crucial uh, to see her approach in its most useful contexts. To begin, the vitality of neighborhoods is central to both the social and respiratory ecology of cities. As you will presently see, I am persuaded uh, by much of what Jacobs argues about urban economies, especially her claims for the energizing mechanism of import substitution. But Jacobs does have a blind spot however usefully and polemically produced, and it lies in the fact that her analysis takes as its predicate an already established condition. Jacob's urban growth model is focused on differentiation rather than extent, and while her critical methods can be applied to judge the qualities of town life, they do not, uh, as many have observed, translate into tools for operating in fresh territory, nor are they well suited to the analysis of regional or of natural forces. A truly ecological view of the city, however, must combine the insights of the local and the global, duh, uh, and frame its decision making at every scale, um, but with a particular favoring of the most intimate. Putting it another way, we must uh, start to solve every ecological question on the demand side of the equation, and this begins with each of us as individuals, with the structures and habits of daily life. If we can walk to work, we don't need a car, and God bless you Dutch bicyclists. Um, if we choose not to eat so much beef, we reduce greenhouse emissions, heart disease, monocropping of corn, animal cruelty, shipping costs, and corporate hegemony over the food chain. If we wear a sweater, less energy is needed to heat the flat. This is obvious. Less obvious are the variety of morphological and functional adaptations that will shape the city and the palette of forms and technologies we must deploy in all the fresh and familiar combinations that will characterize the city of the future and our place within it. Jacobs was disdainful of Ebenezer Howard, both for reasons that were right and for reasons that were wrong.
The dogmatism of his diagrams, the dullness of his architectural imaginary, and the arbitrariness of his numbers were easy targets. But his call for new, autonomously considered, regionally conceived, compact and bounded cities uh, continues to be tonic and influential. Witness the ongoing, if somewhat fatigued, discussion of the idea of compact cities and our renewed interest in the city region. Again, there must be nuance and thinking through the other values city, cities must embody and the range of urban conditions, social, environmental, and morphological in which they might reside. After all, the idea of urban compaction risks embodying the primary conceptual limit of the idea of the ecological footprint, its reduction of a complex of functions and habits to a single variable of size. On the ground, if you will, the creation of sustainable cities is only partially a matter of their literal extent. In thinking about the character uh, of the highly sustainable, reduced footprint cities we need to create, it's important to disaggregate the components of those footprint calculations and to consider each of the elements of urban respiration, food, water, air, temperature, manufacture, movement, buildings, waste, raw material, and so on, as part of the basis for the way in which we design and inhabit our cities. In our work, this has meant a radical reconsideration of the degree to which cities can behave autonomously, a continuation of the quasi-utopian speculations so well embodied by Howard and Mumford, and I am an advocate of an ongoing conversation about the dreamiest propositions for cities to come. Such thinking about limits amounts, among other things, to a controlled experiment, a sort of patch dynamic investigation of a system that is designated, at least provisionally, to be closed. But it also insistently opens an inventive territory in which the literal implications of an autonomous system can be explored. This, I think, has value as a thought experiment with dramatic technical and morphological implications and as a political proposition that will powerfully affect our daily lives and relations. Embedded in much of the work we've done is the not so original but more and more vital idea that democracy flourishes best locally and that cities have been the hothouse for the growth of forms of democratic association from the get-go. Their relevance seems particularly strong today in an era of incompetent and violent nation states and the increasingly hegemonic transnational corporate control of nearly everything. Cities as coherent and responsive entities are threatened by their dissipation into this global field, which imposes itself via the irrelevance of location, the homogeneity of multinational culture, and the loss of both identity and tractability that results from runaway growth and the miseries of the megacity. So I'd like to present four cities that we've designed that investigate strategies of increased urban autonomy from a variety of perspectives, speculations about what the city might be. While the history of the city dates back millennia, Rome had a population of one million uh, over 2,000 years ago, the modern city, the city shaped by technology, industrialization, and capitalist relations of production is something new and frames our work. The task of inventing the form of the city, um, of realizing its potential for beauty and convenience, is still unfolding. And you must look at the work I am about to show you as both proposition and research. These projects are frankly utopian in the sense that their representation depends on an appearance of completion. But this is merely provisional, and I must insist that the discourse of sustainable urbanism vitally depends on making proposals that are not shy about testing their own boundaries and limits. These can ex exist in many registers. A code or a convention can be as important as a construction. But we shouldn't be shy in asserting or criticizing our best ideas about the good. 
Resignation before implacable forces, whether articulated as nature or as culture, is just a formula for suicide. Um, I prefer joy. And now, in conclusion, I would like to show a project about New York City. This has been a research project that's been ongoing now for almost six years. And uh, inshallah, I will live to complete this. Um, we, have, we have finished one volume out of eight. Uh, and if there are any funding agents in this room, a million dollars would see us to the end. Every bit helps. Um, for the past five years, Terraform, uh, our nonprofit um, research institute, has been engaged in a thought experiment. New York City's steady state is an alternative master plan that seeks to make New York City completely self-sufficient, its ecological footprint exactly coterminous with its political boundaries. The idea for this formed a dozen years ago when I began to teach a seminar on urban sustainability at City College. This began, like this lecture, with exercises in using the ecological footprint to clarify the metrics of urban respiration uh, and reach, and the class took various measurements of its own ecological footprints and those of various activities and phenomena in the city. As always, this yielded striking results, and students were suitably abashed at how much of the planet's surface was necessary to produce a Big Mac a pair of jeans, or a ride to the beach. While this was usefully provocative, we wanted to know more and began to delve into the question more specifically, looking at the actual inputs and outputs of these processes. This literalization of the nature of the production in turn gave rise to a broader speculation. What would it mean to literally take responsibility for all the elements required to sustain, sustain us, not as an abstraction, but as a fact of daily life? What, in other words, would it mean to actualize the model of import substitution, to think about the city as a bounded system fully obliged to take care of itself? This was a fantasy that seemed enormously resonant as both a model of sustainability and as a proposition about local collective autonomy. The conceptual predicate of New York City steady state thus became the test of complete self-sufficiency. By pushing the maximum, we gave ourselves a basis uh, we gave ourselves a, 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 a basis for judging not simply the possibility of total urban autarky, um, but for looking at its desirability as both form and practice. Desire is also subject to tests of practicality, and although we have now completed enough work to demonstrate, among other things, that it's possible to feed the current population of New York with food grown entirely within its boundaries, the environmental, economic, political, cultural, culinary, and morphological arguments for doing this are complex, to put it mildly. While our study is surely infused with a romantic, utopian, there's that word again, aroma, it is also designed as an instrument for testing the practicalities and efficiencies of environmental autonomy at a variety of sites. This is not to gainsay circumstances in which there are economies of scale, or even the idea of comparative advantage. But societies and economies are always bounded, and New York City's steady state seeks to examine not simply the fantasy of autarchy, but perhaps more important, a series of moments in the logics of the local, understanding that the defining characteristics of cost-benefit in the environment are not susceptible to purely um, uh, economic uh, arguments. For example, the much-discussed question of food miles is often reflexively understood as a metric in defense not simply of localism, but of a minimized carbon footprint. Um, however, a giant cargo ship of containerized apples sailing from New Zealand to New York actually has a far smaller footprint per apple than a fleet of pickup trucks conveying hand-hewn wooden crates of Macintoshes from upstate to the local food co-op.
But those artisan apples have other advantages irreducible to a matter of burning carbon. We have organized this research by respiratory function and are dealing su su successfully with those eight mantra uh, characteristics, food, water, air and climate, waste, manufacture, energy, movement and building. Each of these, of course, has strong economic, social, and political implications, and each has a complex set of interactions which the, with the others. We've chosen to begin with a focus on food. Not simply is urban agriculture a subject of much, much speculation nowadays, and obviously fundamental to survival, it has the appeal of a certain challenging improbability in the context of the densely built city. Most of the images presented here are from our elementary uh, investigations. We're now almost done with the first volume of a projected eight and have demonstrated that from a purely spatial standpoint, it is possible to produce enough food for eight and a half million people to have at least 2,000 nutritious calories each day. Our work has investigated sites for production at every scale, including buildings, transformed streets, repurposed infrastructure, existing open spaces, and vertical agriculture. Indeed, this latter and highly tasty type of building, constructed in the thousands, would be indispensable to achieving full self-sufficiency. However, vertical farms, the sine qua non of self-sufficient urban agriculture in the popular imagination, require enormous investment, recast the skyline, are incapable of producing certain foods in appropriate quantities, and reinvent the city's planetary position in ways that are far from completely positive. Indeed, one of the primary impediments to a self-sufficient system uh, of vertical urban agriculture is the extremely high energy input required for both illumination and heating, as well as for the massive initial construction. Although enough 30-story agricultural towers, using advanced hydroponic and other cultivation techniques, could be built to supply the city with food on 2% of its total land area, a photovoltaic array sufficient to supply the energy needs would require an area of nearly three and a half times the total surface area of the city, something on the order of 750,000 acres. Alternatively, 28 nuclear power plants could do this job, um, but this is, to put it mildly, um, somewhat contrary to the spirit of the exercise. Um, recognizing the impracticality of this arrangement, we've looked at a series of sweet spots that are more aligned with the prospect of closing neighborhood loops, using producible amounts of energy, reasonable construction investment, and available land. We've sought to investigate a variety of morphological transformations that would characterize a city newly committed to the algorithms of autonomy and to the idea that urban respiration devolves on the most local ses settings. One of the experimental speculations that arose in our investigation of urban in, uh, uh, agriculture is the idea of the figure ground switch. Uh, in which 19th century block patterns see their built mass migrate into the space of the street, freeing the block interiors for the inscription of agriculture and other public uses. When we first began to investigate this formal maneuver, um, we looked at it too simply. Um, to be sure, uh, the idea um, that it was possible to combine the modernist fantasy of living in greenery with a more traditional idea of the centrality of the street was and remains at the center of the proposition. The kind of city in which this might be possible was understood to be one in which the nature of urban circulation had been radically transformed, with streets largely removed from the automobile system and inhabited by pedestrians, bikes, trams, buses, and relatively few small, slow, non-emitting vehicles. The character of these streets was imagined as decidedly pre-modern, uh, and a, a particular inspiration was the medieval and Islamic city, about five minutes. Um, while there's an obvious appeal and viability to this transformation, it was largely directed to questions of movement and of the public realm, to strategies for reconfiguring the ratio of public to private space in the city.
At the conceptual outset, some years ago, we devoted little time to analyzing the actual metrics of sufficiency, the relationship of the new morphology to the needs and numbers of existing populations. As we deepened our research into the production of food, for example, we realized that even if we devoted um, uh, uh, all of the new terraced rooftops and, in, in, and uh, interior courts to agriculture, the harvest was insufficient to feed more than about 2% of the population on the site. The project which is shown here in Sunnyside, Queens reveals something of these dilemmas. It begins with a basic assumption that the population of the blocks under study is to remain constant and the area of calculation will not exceed the dimensions of the streets and blocks under consideration. The question then becomes one of the practicality of solving the problem of food provision in different degrees. In our Luch initial sketch of a simple figure ground switch, the morphology is attractive, but the real potential for genuinely intensive food production is very small. More, uh, more inter in interesting was this 100% scheme. To begin, this does have a stimulating Kowloon-like urban flavor. The densities and architectural relationships are appealing, and the contrast between the narrowed streets and the expansive interiors is attractive. However, the vertical farms uh, on which the scheme depends uh, have their problems. The most constraining of these is the fact that their density compromises efficient solar penetration at their lower levels. This does not preclude production, but means that energy inputs for artificial illum illumination are increased. One solution is to employ uh, the lower portions of the towers for other uses, including residents. Well, this also requires sunlight. Another is simply to have fewer towers. Both result in a reduction in the on-site capacity to, go, to, um, to grow food. Um, consideration of these possibilities leads to the kind of um, more synergistic speculation that is at the core of New York City's steady state. Adding residential units to the site means that housing can be subtracted elsewhere in the city. This is useful in any reconsideration of those parts of New York that are built at suburban densities and heavily dependent on automobiles. The possibility of using additional energy has implications for citywide conservation and production strategies. And the requirement for off-site food growing ramifies in larger strategies for provisioning the city as a whole. In this particular case, the switched blocks are adjacent to one of the very large uh, vertical farm complexes we are proposing, this one above a vast railway yard. Alternatively, this area might be used for solar arrays to provide power for the vertical farms. As part of the study, we have looked at a number of specific architecture, including some prototype vertical farms for both crop and for animal production, and at smaller scale greenhouses, wall systems, and other elements of what is now a fairly well-developed repertoire of agrarian resources. More interesting, we've looked at the way in which these structures and techniques um, can, can, can be integrated into the fabric of the city and have been particularly interested in the reclamation of spaces of the street from an automobile-dominated movement culture to a broader mix of public uses, including agriculture. We've looked at all scales from window boxes to skyscrapers in order to suggest a system in which production is not monopolized by the urban equivalent of the agribusiness this whole project intends in its crazy way to critique. At the larger scale, we've investigated scenarios for the reconfiguration of the city as a whole to allow it to grow 100% of its food supply. The main media for production includes large areas of vertical farms, particularly in portions of the cities that are currently built at suburban densities. Figure ground switches, overbuilding of highway and rail infrastructures, and intensive utilization of rooftops, vacant lots, brownfields, and other uh, available open, open spaces. Our larger reimagining of the city is based on an intensification of neighborhood autonomy and a strong preference for local accountability in all aspects of urban respiration. The drawings are diagrammatic, 
We don't imagine a literal circular morphology uh, for those transformed neighborhoods, but we do intend their recalibration on the basis of walk time and the emergence of a green supergrid as a zone of circulation, agriculture, climate control, recreation, water management, and organization. We are also in the process of designing a uh, very good slide is missing, uh, of designing a repurposed subway system to facilitate not simply the movement of people, um, but of goods. We anticipate that the completion of this study will take another five years and that we will be able to demonstrate the very high degree to which it is possible to radically ratchet up the autonomy of the city. The encyclopedia of technologies and morphologies that are represented in the work are meant to offer a practical lexicon for the global transformation of cities and the broader assumptions of urban culture about the nature of human autonomy that must increasingly characterize a planet alert to its limits and moved to deal both with distributive justice and with our very survival. Thank you for your indulgence and forgive me for speaking too long. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Michael. So far, the cascade of ideas, views, data, critical views, etc. Um, some of you need a rest now because it was a lot, I think, a lot of information. But others have, no doubt, questions or comments. We have about a quarter of an hour to do so. What are the uh, implications of, um, on a financial level and actually on the level of um, putting in all the resources to build all those buildings? In the last scheme, you mean, the New York? Yeah, exactly. Have you done some financial research in that? Yeah. Michael? Um, w w one, one way of dealing with the implication of the financial resources is simply to say that it is a thought, a thought experiment that investigates another realm. Um, another way of, of talking about the financial implications is to say um, that the, the, the whole discourse of import substitution um, uh, uh, is, is a kind of economic theory that, theory that has some legs from, from the 19th century on down. Um, one can argue, uh, you know, from the experience of Latin America in the 1950s, um, you know, from uh, the less successful experience of North Korea, um, from a variety of utopian uh, and communal experiments, um, that there are arguments for closing economies that lead to a, a kind of internal differentiation. Um, my, my particular uh, inspiration for thinking about this was, of course, the Jane Jacobs argument, um, who, who argues that um, um, the that the, the countryside is not something that produced cities um, via its intensification, but that cities in fact produced uh, the countryside via the kind of expansion of their needs. Are you um, answering the question on finances now or yes, not? Yes, I, I am. You are? I, okay. I am, I am talking about the I economics of the it. proposition. Okay. So, so there, there, there is a kind of an economic school about import substitution that argues that in the case of the nation state, the erection of tariff barriers, the creation of an artificial economy, um, you know, drives production. Um, there's another argument, um, which is, I think, best expressed in the, the more contemporary school of so-called um, ecological economics, which says that um, certain, certain kinds of conventional economics for discussing food production, for example, um, are denying a whole series, or energy, deny a whole series of so-called externalities. That once you add in the cost of pollution, environmental degradation, uh, slave labor, et cetera, et cetera, and you come to a real price for a commodity, um, it is so much higher than that which is represented uh, by, by the, the current multinational capitalist system that the whole economy is distorted. Um, third answer is, yes, of course, we've run some numbers. So one of the things we've discovered in food production, for example, is that uh, at the level of any kind of conventional economic analysis, growing 100% of the food for New York City is ridiculous. Um, we weren't quite expecting that the, 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 the key fact, the key driver in the absurdity of this was going to be energy. 
um, which turns out to be the really big input in, in terms of construction. Because there are savings, um, there are economic advantages, there are you know, reduced transportation costs, increased local autonomy, empo employment possibilities, et cetera, et cetera, uh, reusing uh, existing industrial buildings, but energy is a killer. So, you know, in the, in the fuller version of the research, um, what we have shown is that there are a series of um, sweet spots, and we're looking now at a kind of 30% scheme um, in which uh, a much more conventional economic analysis, produ analysis um, is productive. Yeah. I hope you're satisfied with this answer, yeah? Okay. Shall I continue? No, 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 no. But I, look, so, I, 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 have to, I have to say something to you because um, the, intro, the introduction, the, the interruption was predicated that the idea of a kind of microeconomic analysis, um, you know, is the one that wins um, when we are facing a global crisis which requires a certain um, macroeconomic transformation. Okay. Hello, my name is Rolf Kamen. I have a question about the more the change of social identity. What will I mean the, if you do all that change? How will it like uh, socially or politically change the identity of the of the city? Obviously, I am making a, a, cer a certain argument uh, ag against the way in which um, the idea of difference um, is co-opted commercially and, and rendered ridiculous. So. How, how do we find, yeah, this is a key question, is how, how do we find meaningful identities um, in a global culture um, that is, using, is, is trying very hard to both appropriate, manipulate, and obliterate them? Um, so the two, the two arguments, I guess, that I'm making um, uh, are one, uh, that um, neighborhoods are foundational. Um, I, I think that the, the, the discourse of localist politics, um, which is you know, very big nowadays, I think both in the Netherlands and the United States, um, is a key source uh, in the struggle for identity and citizenship. I'm certainly somebody who thinks that megacities, for example, um, are out of control. Um, that cities that are too big, too homogeneous, and too disorganized in a way um, are um, the enemies of democracy. So a kind of localist organization around production, around education, around living, around growing food um, is something very important to, to, to the creation of social life. Um, the other question, um, you know, a l little bit of a different answer, which I think was re revealed in the, the first project, is um, there is a tendency um, for uh, the homogenization of space in multinational culture. I mean, you travel around China, looks like Cleveland, looks like every other city in, si in China. So, on the one hand, the, the idea that there is a, a kind of increment of organization, the neighborhood, um, that conduces local organization and identity is very important. But I'm also making the argument that um, at, at a time in which anything can be anywhere, that um, the, the artistic design of cities um, represents a kind of axis of resistance um, to, to the sameness and provides an opportunity for identity. So. Um, to the degree that the, the, the kind of historical formation of local cultures is under attack, we need to introduce um, new irritants, as it were, around which localisms can develop. And I think one of these is uh, artistic and spatial difference in the design of cities. Thank you. Who else? Um, the, the, back to New York, the, the New York project. I can understand the relevance of the project. I don't understand the idea why New York should be seen or conceived as authentic. Why is that? I mean, in a time that everybody is talking about network cities, about lines between cities, etc., why, why is it relevant to pound it as, as if it is a medieval city? Yeah. Well. Uh, it, it, how long do I have? Uh, Two minutes. Yeah. Num number one, as I said, it's a it's a kind of a thought experiment, um, and what we will produce, you know, is both um, at the margin uh, proof that it could actually happen, um, but the, the the actual production is of an encyclopedia of, of the the morphologies and technologies that might be used for cities that were seeking not to be 100% autonomous, but 10% or 20% or 30%. I think that's the, the real meaning of the, 
the, the project. It, and it's also a kind of a riposte to the idea um, that we can transfer responsibility somewhere else. So um, if one is going to take responsibility for one's impacts on the climate, um, and this is, you know, for us in the West, um, this, is, this is extreme because we are piggishly consuming the majority of the world's resources. If we are going to take responsibility, you know, if we are going to, to somehow um, harmonize our footprint with the woman in Ghana, um, then we have to do it in our own territory, you know, in, in our own place. So this is a kind of radical proposition about a politics of taking responsibility for your own shit. So let us see the degree to which we can realize this radical responsibility taking within our city. And that, that's why the, the, the boundary was set um, in terms of the political limits of New York. You know, in the course of doing the food chapter, you know, we have plan B, which is the 100-mile plan, and we have plan C, which is the next political increment up, which is New York State, you know, which is, which is easy. Um, but, you know, if you're going to conduct a radical experiment, it's like a patch dynamic research. You need to define the edges of the patch um, in, an arb in, in, in what is, in many ways, a completely arbitrary way. So. We've done it. Okay, the, uh, that's uh, one more question about this uh, about this New York issue. You have you are studying now. You're researching now for five years on this project. Yeah. No doubt you have had enormous amount of discussions and debate in the city about with politicians, with other scientists, with uh, everybody. What is the reaction of those people, again, uh, uh, towards these, these findings and these research? Because, because, the, because each component part of the research is reasonable, um, we get many, many positive reactions. You know, pe people say, well, you know, it's crazy. It's, cra it's crazy at the margin, but you know, one of the things we've proposed is that um, one half the area of the street surface of New York be repurposed. You know, so that's, that's possible. Um, another thing we've proposed is that the subway, um, which is underutilized in certain hours, be used for the distribution of freight. Well, that's not unreasonable. Um, another thing we've proposed, um, uh, a certain number of um, vertical, everybody's talking about vertical agriculture these days. So a, f a few 30-story farms, all right. And in in indeed, you know, uh, the, this, the, 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 this is another discussion, but why, why this kind of attachment to food culture uh, as a kind of wedge into questions of sustainability has become so important, the so-called locavore movement, I assume you have that here, or the slow food movement. So anything that has a kind of sniff of, food, of local food production um, has a very positive vibe. Um, so I would, I would say that, um, yeah, I mean, who, who's, who other than the Shell Oil Company is, is against uh, uh, non-fossil fuel? energy. So, I mean, as I say, that, that's, I think that's the, the, the interesting part of the problem is that um, if you disaggregate it, if you look at every given suggestion, and one of the premises of this project is that it employs no technology that does not either exist or is e easily foreseeable. So, you know, you can use a lot of, it, 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 photovoltaic energy is uh, more expensive than uh, coal-fired energy at the moment, but not for long. So. All of the, I mean, that's one of the predicates of the project is that um, no, no anti-gravity paint, you know, is no, no cold fusion, um, only existing and foreseeable technologies um, uh, are used in order to begin to suggest styles of organizing the city, um, which themselves turn out to be quite different. Okay. One more question, yes. My name is Paul de Graaf. I've been working on urban agriculture in Rotterdam. Um, I'm interested um, if you uh, consider the, the Ebenezer Howard uh, scheme of the Garden City. It's uh, one of the reasons it failed was because there was uh, the, the issue of access to land wasn't uh, dealt with. Finally, the, 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 already back then, the project the developers took over. So uh, in parallel to the financial question, how do you deal with access to food production uh, as a basic right in this scheme of yours? I mean, this, this is a scheme about growing all of New York City's food in New York City. So there would be, uh, you know, it's, obviously it's about access. Well, it would be uh, who would be in, in, in control of the production and who yeah, would this, earn the money, uh, for is, example. And, yeah, this is obviously a key question. You know, one of the things that happens if you have um, industrial-scaled 
uh, food production is that you're likely to get corporatist agriculture and be because of the nature of the investment. So we look at alternative investment strategies for this and wonder how a small farmer can function in a vertical building. And one of the, you know, one of the models that we imagine is, is exactly the industrial loft building that, that I began to talk about. And there's no reason why uh, a large-scale project cannot be partitioned uh, to be utilized by a variety of small producers. You know, what, one of the other models that we, we use in thinking about this kind of scale of, of production um, is that, you know, even in the United States, um, we have been habituated to producing certain kinds of public utility at a very large scale. So, for example, um, a million people in New York City live in public housing all of which was built in a period of about 30 years, right? So the, the actual volume of enclosed space built by government for housing in New York City is not so different from the volume of enclosed space that would be needed to be built perhaps by government in New York City for agriculture. So in, in this sense, it's not a completely unprecedented possibility. You know, we think that we also have a, a medical system, uh, we, we have a thou thousands of public schools, we have a hospital system, we have a mass transportation system, all of which represent comparable levels of public investment. So, I mean, it's, it's, a, it, it's a political question. Uh, I think it um, could be financed. Um, obviously, uh, the, the, the risk is uh, that it, it gives the image of a kind of corporatist solution. Um, but I'm certainly also interested in the Ebenezer Howard scale garden city. Yep. You know, it is a salient fact of our lives as urbanists that one million people are added to the population of cities every single week. So. How many Ebenezer Howard, Ebenezer Howard garden cities do we need to build? What, 10 a week, 20 a week? Uh, you know, as, as one possible alternative to dealing with the problem of the, the slum and the megacity, you know, this is one that should be very rich and alive, and I, I, would, I would love to see a million garden cities uh, around the world. Michael, let me finish with one other question. Um, a Leninist one. A what? Leninist question. Yes? Okay. Um, your, uh, your observation is, yeah, you start your observation with, we're going to hell. All of them. All of us. The, because of we, we need, we use too much energy, we eat too much food, uh, too much meat, uh, we don't cycle enough, etc., etc. That's all, it's all clear. Um, you come up with, you could say, research, you come up with positive models, is that the answer, is that what we have to do? That is the Leninist question, what to do? What would you say to this audience in their practices? What would you suggest them to do? I, th I thought you were going to ask me the sustainability in one, quest in sustainability in one city question versus the internationalization of sustainability question. No, no, I'm not asking that question, uh, no. Um, well, I, I, I think there are a couple of answers to the question. Is one, of, one of them obviously is to, um, uh, is exactly as you say, to um, um, make righteous propaganda for, for another way, uh, num number one. Uh, number two is, um, you know, Occupy will be back in the streets. Uh, that's another form of propaganda. But, uh, you know, I, I'm, not, not exactly sure who is in this audience, but um, I do imagine that many of you are practitioners. Yeah. Uh, and, yes. Huh? Yes. They so, are. So, you know, one, one of the frustrations of practice, as you know, is that um, you push, the client demurs, uh, you know, and, and you make a compromise. Um, but uh, a kind of continuous insistence on moving the barrier a little bit at a time, you know, is, is also possible. I, I, I was watching TV yesterday, uh, and there was a kind of BBC program about um, Marxism, um, you know, with, uh, uh, I think maybe because Eric, Eric Hobsbawm Bob died. He died. Huh? Eric Sorry. Hobsbawm died yesterday. Uh, so, you know, there was Slavoj Žižek, and there was, uh, uh, you know, Tariq Ali, and, uh, and there, there was David Harvey, you know, our, our, our greatest Marxist geographer. 
um, who was saying, you know, this, the contradictions of capitalism are now at, 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 in such a crisis that we have to think about revolutionary possibilities. So I, I, I open to you that there are a span of practices. Um, you know, I, I am fatigued with the sectarian disputes that I grew up in in the 1960s, but I think propaganda is important. I think pushing the envelope wherever you can is important, um, and arguing for um, the revolutionary possibilities of the moment, even if we are not yet quite clear about what form they will take, um, is indispensable to the joyful practice of any true urbanist. Thank you very much, Michael. As a small token of their gratitude, uh, the book you see there, Sustainable Urban Design. Anarchist, That's for you. In anarchist black. Yes. Right, right. Thank you. Thank you.